Welcome to episode five of the Truth Snack Podcast. This episode is a rebroadcast of my interview on the Youth Pastor Theologian Podcast. My friend Mike invited me on to talk about faith, doubt, and everything in between. If you're in youth ministry, Mike's work is an incredible resource that can be found at youthpastortheologian.com. I'm always thrilled to partner with Youth Pastor Theologian, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Mine and Mike's conversation was in the context of youth ministry, but almost everything we talked about is relevant to how all Christians can navigate doubt. So I thought I'd share that conversation here. Enjoy. It's always fun to get to know our guests as teenagers a little bit. So uh, Matt, when you were a teenager, did you have a go-to look or favorite article clothing? Um, What was your drip when you were a teenager? (laughs) <laughs> well, I never would have called it a drip, but I did have one. Um, <laughs> I, I think I was in a really weird phase of my life, which maybe is continuing in some ways, where I loved thrift stores. And I would go to thrift stores all the time. And so I would just, and I was just like a cheap teenager who didn't really have money to spend anyway. And so I would go in and I would just purchase like, jokey things from thrift stores. Like I would get t-shirts for like moving companies or like, you know, or some, some like low level (laughs) sports team that no one cares about or like a grocery store, like work shirt. Like I would just get these clothes that were just clearly ridiculous (laughs) and I would just wear them all the time. And, uh, and I would do that like kind of when I wasn't at school. And then when I was at school, I went to a school with the uniform and, you know, so you had to wear like the white shirt and basically like blue dress pants. It's very boring uniform, but you were yeah. allowed to wear any tie yeah. you wanted. And so I would go to thrift stores and just pick up these wacky, ugly ties. And that was my, my within the rules way of rebelling against the system. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I can wear just That's the worst, so ugliest tie and no teacher could tell me I, can't, I have to take it off. So I would just do that. That's incredible. And let, let, let's... Let's not psychoanalyze the dress code, rigid dress code leading to just thrift <laughs> store ridiculousness, right? <laughs> yes. There is something I, to learn about it. me. I think it's indicative of how I Probably. handle situations sometimes. It's like, yeah. well, I have to play within these rules, but I'm going to find ways to, to bend them without breaking them. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Hey, so uh, faith and doubt. Uh, super important topics, uh, so much conversation going on right now about uh, faith and deconstruction and um, how do we minister to students who are facing doubts and who are uh, entering into deconstruction, usually when they graduate from high school. I, I don't honestly, I don't usually hear too many high schoolers talking about deconstruction. That's usually more mm-hmm. college and, and young adults. But but teenagers are facing doubt um, that sometimes leads to deconstruction, sometimes doesn't. Um, but as we're, as we're doing youth ministry and youth work, um, how, how are we helping students navigate the hard questions that they're struggling with? That's the topic that we want to discuss uh, together today. And uh, you have um, a really compelling story for your own uh, journey through through faith and doubt and everything. So could you share with us a little bit of, of your own journey and how that's shaped your current ministry? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that, um, mostly because I think it's so important for stories of doubt and deconstruction to be told. Uh, I think it's important, particularly for people who are feeling or, you know, it, enduring doubt and going through deconstruction to hear yeah. stories of other Christians and particularly a, a hopeful perspective because you can Instagram deconstruction yeah. and you're going to get a lot there. Some that will be helpful and some that won't. So I think it's important to tell hopeful stories. And while my story has difficult parts, it is uh, at the end of the day, a hopeful story. So I started doubting significantly when I was actually at Bible college, which is in some ways, the best place to doubt because you're like, great, (laughs) I have like a theological library and professors. And the worst, because everyone else (laughs) seems so confident, you're like, I'm not sure anymore that I really believe this. So that was really difficult in university. And I made some peace with it, but I graduated, became a youth pastor, and, uh, and it kept popping up. 
and and despite my best efforts to mm-hmm. kind of push those questions down, uh, you know, I did that yeah. unsuccessfully. And so in that kind of initial phase uh, as a pastor, I had a lot of questions about the New Testament and the Bible and the identity of Jesus and how we could be confident that Jesus was really God or that he rose from the dead. So I had, there was kind of a, a, this dimension to it. And, and a lot of that was helped by going into apologetics, you know, by figuring out who Mike Lacona is and William Lane Craig, uh, you know, these apologists and New Testament scholars who have something to offer to help answer those questions that I had about the Bible and whether it's trustworthy. That was part of my journey. And, and that was helpful. I, I don't want, it's easy to talk about it in a minute or two, but that really took years of my life. I was pastoring mm-hmm. by day and I would go home and I'd make supper and I would study the New Testament at night for hours um, and listen to lectures. And, and I'm taking my own notes, comparing the, the resurrection accounts and seeing if there are inconsistencies. And I'm doing my own work to try to make sense of that. And because of some of those scholars, mm-hmm. I, I found that I was able to make some sense of that. But then a few years later, I had a really difficult experience where I encountered some Christians that, I, what label to give them? I guess I would say I felt that they were really toxic Christians. And I was just mm-hmm. really hurt by the way I was treated by them. I felt betrayed. I felt yeah. lied about. I felt conspired against. And that was devastating to me uh, emotionally. Um, I was hurt and yeah. I and I left ministry and I even stopped attending church. And so it was kind of this interesting place where I I had done this like kind of intellectual apologetics work where I'm like more confident that God is real. <laughs> but then I'm like, but I have no desire to be in church <laughs> with these people that yeah. I don't trust anymore. And so um, and so then there was more years of learning to forgive and make peace and live in the tension sometimes of unresolved broken re- relationships. So then there's this whole emotional maturity and process I go through. Um, So that's what it looks like. But my story is is to say that when people go through those different journeys that can bring on doubt and deconstruction, there is a way to journey through it. I know that because God has helped me journey through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, when you're ministering to students and talking with with people who who approach you and ask for for help and support and have questions and how do I handle my doubts and uh, I'm not really sure what I believe and what I don't and um wh- what are some what are some first questions that you tend to ask them and what have you learned from your own experience that that helps you minister to others who are kind of in the early stages of doubt yeah, so many things come to mind when I hear that. I got, you're going to pick and choose and then we'll come back around. Uh, yeah. I think the first thing I would say is be very eager to listen. Listen. Yeah. Listen to people who are expressing their doubts because they might not even know why they're experiencing those doubts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they think they have a question that they want answered. But one thing I've seen when ministering to doubters is they have a question and you can answer it and they might even be satisfied by that answer. But another question replaces it immediately. Right. I call that the doubt treadmill. And if, yeah. and if you're having that relationship or conversation with someone, what that means is that they haven't yet actually identified the core issue. That there's actually mm-hmm. something deeper that's spawning a bunch of different questions that are all related to a core issue. And so I would just say when someone starts expressing that they're having doubts and they're asking tough questions, understand that it's not actually about the question sometimes. They're asking a question and, and other people might be asking that, that same question, but they don't necessarily want the same answer because we haven't yeah. identified what's really going on at the core yet. So I can't express right. how important it is to slow down with people, not just throw a book or a video at them, but to try to understand what's beneath that question. What's, what's actually mm-hmm. driving it? So some biblical examples real quick is like the rich young ruler. And I love what Jesus does with the rich young ruler, the Pharisees, the woman at the well. These people come to Jesus with questions, questions that other people are asking too. 
but we see yeah. a rich young ruler asking a question about how he inherits the kingdom of God. He's rich and he's asking about an inheritance. Okay, the woman at the well, she comes to Jesus. She's been rejected her whole life. She's asking Jesus, what do I have to do for my worship to be accepted by God? The Pharisees who are concerned about allegiance and power are asking Jesus, do you pay taxes to Caesar or not? Where does your allegiance lie? Right? So who these people are mm -hmm. and what's going on within their hearts is what's really spawning the questions. What's brilliant about Jesus is that he always goes to the heart. He doesn't just yeah. answer the question. He does that, but he goes deeper. Yeah. So uh, Jesus just handles these things brilliantly and we can learn so much from him. Yeah. So you're saying Jesus is a good example, huh? How about that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He does it really well. <laughs> wow. Shocking. <laughs> I, think, I think we might have a few things to learn from that guy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's there's a, a question behind the question, right? And, and so that doesn't mean that yeah, what we're, the question that we're hearing on the surface, that doesn't mean that question it is unimportant. But as mm -hmm. we're working through that question with students, let's be discerning to listen to the question beneath the question um so obviously yeah. there's no you know one cause behind doubt and deconstruction and these types of things um so what are some mm -hmm. factors or themes or question common questions behind the questions uh, that that you would recommend youth workers to keep in mind as they minister to these students yeah i think the questions behind the questions often come back to like, you know, core fears or pains that we have in our life. That can be vague. But the theme that I see is that they're often connected to unmet expectations. So doubt, generally speaking, causes anxiety, some fear, some discomfort in people. The reason that's happening is because doubt is the pain you feel in a paradigm shift. So a good, mm -hmm. another good biblical example here, and, and this is kind of like the theme, I think you said, uh, like the theme or some, you know, few factors that kind of come up again is I yeah. think unmet yeah. expectations create doubts. My own story, okay. I expected the yeah. Bible to function in a certain way where uh, things were always very crisp and clean, and yet I find these gospel accounts and they approach things different ways, and that created and then I realized my expectations weren't being met threw me in a loop. Yeah. But within yeah. the Bible, you have John the Baptist who expects Jesus to be the Messiah. Great. He's right about that. But then yeah. when John finds himself in prison, well, this doesn't, this wasn't part of John's plan. You know, Jesus was yeah. going to be the Messiah and bring the kingdom of God. John's about to be killed in prison. He sends a message right. to Jesus. Are you the Messiah or should we expect someone else? So this is just a great example of, of John rightly goes, Jesus is the Messiah. He declared it, the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world. But when his expectations of what that mean isn't fulfilled, it throws him in a loop. And Jesus has to say, okay, John, you're not wrong. I'm not going to deny that I'm the Messiah, but I'm going to quote Isaiah to show you that the work I'm doing of healing the blind and, and healing people right now, that is the work of the Messiah. So I'm going to expand yeah. your concept and I'm going to help you yeah. mature and grow. So that's what I see like that when people are experiencing doubt, they're experiencing unmet expectations it, with Jesus, God, the Bible, the church, mm -hmm. Christians, themselves, life. Like there's so many things that can throw us in a loop. We need to be willing to encounter God for him to actually expand our understanding to something that is truer to reality. Yeah, no, that's really good. Um, I think that's really insightful about expectations and what what do we think should happen right and especially for mm -hmm. for church kids who are growing up um in a christian household in a christian family in a christian church maybe in homeschooled christian private school like um yeah what happens when you witness brokenness uh when others do not mm -hmm. treat you as they should um, or when life just goes unhinged, um, I think we've we've all tasted that personally and seen it in others. Um, just how suffering can lead to these real difficult seasons of of, of doubt. Um, 
Yeah. And I think you're bringing up kind of the problem of pain uh, and suffering. And that's a great example. It's like, not only that we have unmet expectations there, but it's when it becomes real in our lives. Like we're all sitting, I mean, I'm sitting here today and I know there's untold, like just horrible suffering going on in the world. And that doesn't rattle me. And sometimes it does rattle me, but, but often it doesn't rattle me. But when it comes home, it comes to roost in my life. Then it's like, whoa, right. here's, here's the crisis that comes because it's become real to me. So yeah, yeah. like that's another, that's another theme about kind of what goes on in people's lives is I, I see it kind of coming up out of unmet expectations, but it's also often when something becomes real in their lives. We all know there's suffering in the world, but when we suffer, yeah. it's different and it causes doubt in a different way. All right. So I know we didn't, we didn't prep this question, so I'm going off the rails a little bit. Yeah. Um, that's but okay. Let's go. I think sometimes, yeah. All right. So uncharted territory. Um, I think when, when we're talking about apologetics and when we're talking about ministering to kids who, who are doubting or other adults who are doubting, um, it's easy for us to think about giving the facts, right? How do I answer this question? How do I answer that question? And when people start doubting um, or deconstructing from their faith because of personal suffering or because of uh, injustice or because of hypocrisy in the church, it can, I've heard, I've heard other ministers kind of respond in ways as if that's not a valid reason to doubt or to start losing faith because it's a emotional response, not an intellectual disagreement with doctrine and Bible and right. So how Mm -hmm. do we, I I don't really agree with that. Like I I think. Sure. Faith and work, faith and work flow together. Right. Um, And so if our faith doesn't work and (laughs) um, I, I, I very much understand how that can lead to doubt and to, to loss of faith. Um, Can you just kind of reflect on that and maybe offer a few suggestions on how do we take those objections to the faith seriously that are not primarily intellectual, but lived experience? Yeah, so hopefully it's clear, or I've represented what I really think, which is that uh, I think that when people are doubting, even though it can express itself in intellectual questions, that there's almost always something deeper going on, especially if anxiety Mm -hmm. and fear is coming up. That shows that there's there's something deeper here than just like the, you know, like when was the book of Matthew written this time? Okay. Like there's something more there. So for someone to say it's, it's illegitimate to question Christianity because it's just emotional. I mean, I would go, that's like modernism to the extreme. I'd go and Jesus tells us what it, what it means to live in his kingdom and to be who he made us to be is to love him with the, our entire being, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to say, oh, well, because it's not working emotionally, that's not a good enough reason. I'm like, wait, but Jesus wants to redeem that situation. That makes it sound like the gospel somehow right. doesn't touch the pain and suffering that we're experiencing. What? That's yeah. not the New Testament yeah. I read. Yeah. Jesus is yeah. going to renew all things. So I would just hear that and go, oh, I, I, A, I don't think that's good theology. B, that's a quick way to hurt hearts is to say that's not good enough. Well, you can say it's not a good enough reason to doubt all you want. It's creating doubts. <laughs> so a pastor says, okay, let me mm-hmm. engage with your heart. Here's Jesus' example. Jesus does not show up to the tomb of Lazarus and say, why are you crying? And yeah. that's what that pastor or person would do. Why are you crying? I'm here and I'm going to make it good. You know, there's no reason to cry yeah. much more. There's no reason for Jesus to cry because he knows what he's going to do. He has faith in the father. Mm-hmm. There's no reason for him to cry except that he is just genuinely compassionate and moved by our suffering. Yeah. Because there's no intellectual reason for Jesus to cry. <laughs> So again, if we're mm-hmm. to be anything like Jesus, when people say, I'm, I'm devastated because of the pain and suffering, we can go, well, that's not a good enough reason. Or we can cry with people. I think that's yeah. the heart of Jesus. Yes. 
Yeah. I, I think that that's, I mean, we're, we're whole people, right? Like we're not just like yeah. a living that's brain a great way of with a body. It. Like minister yeah, to the not, whole we're kid. We're not computers, like, and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> very good. That is very good. Um, so I mean, I, I'm just a little. Yeah, sometimes leading a ministry called youth pastor theologian. Sometimes I just get a little bit mm. afraid that it just the title right of the ministry can give the impression that mm. it's it's really just the information of theology, right? But like theologically speaking, we are right. whole people. Of what does it mean to be a human being? Um, it, it, it's more than just your head and what you think and what you believe doctrinally, um, but the emotions, Absolutely. the will, the heart, um, th these are all God given, uh, elements of what it means to be created in his image. And so when, um, when the heart is broken, it leads to struggles the same way that when the mind is broken, it leads to struggles, right? Yeah. So we, we want to minister to the whole person, not just the intellectual. Yeah. I, beautifully said. Um, and Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. And he means that. <laughs> so that includes our mm -hmm. emotions. And I think, yeah, there's, there can be a tendency in some Christian traditions to be very skeptical of emotions. And I'm not saying emotions yeah. are always... Yeah a sound ruler by which to judge the rest of reality, but they certainly right. do represent a part of reality, particularly what's going on within us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So um, we don't want students to live in doubt forever, right? We want to minister to, mm -hmm. to students who are doubting. Um, we want to acknowledge that sometimes doubt is persistent and sometimes doubt does mm -hmm. last a really, really long time. Um, and we want to acknowledge that, um, but we, we want to lead, um, students to confident faith, but what mm -hmm. does walking by faith look like in the midst of doubt? And how do we lead students to walk in faith out from doubt? So there's a few things that I would say to that. And the first is to acknowledge and, and I, to acknowledge that it takes time. And I think people do need to yeah. hear that because, yeah. you know, like we do live in an age where it is easy to get information and find solutions quickly online. And I'm not mm -hmm. like, you know, taken away from how wonderful it is to know how to fix your car by just YouTube. Yeah. Like that's great. Yeah. But because of kind of everything we've just said about the complexity of our own lives and emotions and relationships with God, this process is not fast. It's slow. Yeah. And journeying through yeah. doubt, because I think really what's going on in doubt is you're going through a journey of maturity and maturing in what you believe and, and, you, and in your relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just take a week or a month. It can take years. In fact, it'll take a yeah. lifetime. So we need to acknowledge that. And then I think we need to help students or leaders or pastors or anyone understand that in that long journey, you need to keep showing up to God through the means he's provided. That's yeah. important to be reading scripture, to be using your reason, to be connecting with people in church, to be seeking God in a personal, intimate, experiential way. It's a little bit, yep. sometimes I'll say like, it is a little bit like, what do you do to be healthy? Like you get good sleep, you eat good food, you know, yep. uh, you exercise. We know, we know these things. And it's not yep. that any one of those things is just like a silver bullet that fixes the problem. But in showing up to God over and over again does transform us <laughs> the same way eating right. well over time transforms us. So it's not that these things are a formula, A plus B plus C equals, you know, faith. No, yeah. Yeah. It, it's that you're showing up to a living God. And, and I think we need to encourage people that you're going to feel confused and you're also going to feel like it's taking too long but it matters to show up to God and to invite God because when we invite anyone, mm -hmm. not just God, when we invite people, it changes our attention and our intention. We pay attention yeah. for their coming and it says that we intend to respond when they do come. And when our attention yeah. and intentions are transformed, it changes how we receive things. So to show up to God with invitation matters and it, and it takes a lot more time than we'd like. Um, 
Yeah. But like there's biblical precedent for that too. When Elijah is, is going through depression and doubt himself in first Kings 19, God brings him through the wilderness to Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. And God, uh, that journey can take about 10 days, but God takes Elijah on a 40 day journey. Classic yeah. doubt situation. Like Elijah is going to have an encounter with God at the mountain. We know that because we know the story, mm -hmm. but God takes him on a mm -hmm. longer journey than Elijah wants. Why? Because God actually wants Elijah to, to think of what's going on in his life and match it up against the backdrop of what happened with Israel in the desert for 40 years. And then Elijah gets mm -hmm. to the mountain and he thinks he's going to experience the lightning and the thunder and the power of God. Those, those are his expectations. And God appears in a different way through a still small voice. So Elijah's having doubt because of unmet expectation, because God's not bringing fire and thunder and killing Jezebel and all the enemies. And then <laughs> Elijah goes on a longer journey than he wants to so that yeah. God can get his heart open to, I am that God but I'm also different. There's something more you need to learn about me here. I have people, yeah. thousands of people who have not turned their heart away from me. So let's be open to something new. So, I mean, the journey, now that's not comfortable to say to people, it's going to be longer than you mm -hmm. want, but God's taking you on that path for a reason. And we see that in the story of Elijah. And I'll just say kind of in wrapping up this section, there is a difference between a journey and a pilgrimage. A journey is yeah. A to B. You know, you journey to the grocery store. You just get there and then you come back. But Elijah goes on a pilgrimage because a pilgrimage by its very nature transforms you as part of the journey. So we need to mm -hmm. see, I use journey language all the time, but when we're talking about doubt, we're not just talking about journeys. We're talking about pilgrimages. We have to remember that yeah. the goal is not just to get back to confident faith. You actually can't get there without being transformed on the way. Yeah. That's a good word. And so what is, so if we're, if we're taking kids, um, not just on a journey, but a pilgrimage, right? Um, and our mm. destination is the gospel, um, the, the, the finished work of Christ, of what, who is Jesus? Uh, what has he done? Uh, why does this matter? Uh, not just for evangelism and to get us saved, right? but that the gospel is the message of life and joy and hope. Um, when we think about the promise of the gospel, it really is good news of great joy for all people. Um, what, does, what does the gospel say to, to students who are navigating doubt um, and who feel like they're losing their faith? Um, how would you, how would you proclaim and apply the gospel to those students? I don't know if I have a good answer to that question other than, I mean, I would try to bring some hope to it. I know what it feels like to think you're losing your faith. Like I, I know that I know that feeling deeply personally. It's terrifying. I would say that doesn't have to be your story. And I'd say it might feel like you're dying right now. Like it feels that painful and that hard that it's like this, my life is falling apart. I do, like it's so disorienting to be caught in doubt. Feels like death. But one of my mentors says, you know, with God, the dying with God is a different kind of dying because it, it's always connected with resurrection. And um, the things that get burned off when we're dying were all the things that were killing us to begin with. And that's the only hope that I can give in this is that it is hard. Um, you don't have to do it alone. You can do it with people, but you can also do it with God. And there is a dying that's happening here. And I think to deny that is to miss what's really going on. But there is a resurrection there. Ah, and so I don't say this flippantly at all, but this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus does tell us to take up our cross every day. Christianity is not a religion that tells us because Jesus died on a cross, we don't have to. We don't have to pay for our sins, but we do have to die mm -hmm. on a cross. Jesus tells us 
to die on a cross every day. That's what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And that is that doesn't feel like good news. And it isn't unless there is a God who will perpetually resurrect us every day into something new. So all I can say to the doubter who's in that pain is don't do it alone. Show up to God. Do it with others. It does feel like dying. There is a God who resurrects. That is the gospel. Mm-hmm. So that's all I can say. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a good word. And, and I would add too, um, the gospel means that God's love and mercy is big enough to carry you through your doubt, right? That our faith is not our work, um, that our faith is placed fully in Jesus and in what Mm -hmm. he has done on our behalf. So even if your faith is weak, okay, um, it's not your faith that saves you anyways, it's your faith yeah. in Jesus, and Jesus is the one who saves, not the strength of your faith. So even if your faith is faltering, and even if your faith is just running on fumes, Jesus is big enough to carry you in in those seasons. Um, and the gospel is not about you. And the gospel is not about how strong your faith is. Um, mm-hmm. But the the sovereign and powerful mercy and grace of Jesus will and can carry you. Um, So even if you feel like you've got nothing left, um, just rest in the faithful provision of the grace of Jesus. I think that, that, that is the message of the gospel, right? It's, I mean, it's so your spot on, Mike, that it's not, and that needs to be said, what you've just said, is that it's not the strength of how much we feel our faith that makes it effective. It's putting it in something or someone that's worthy of it. Amen. <laughs> and Jesus is worthy of it. Amen. Um, so as we, as we wrap up our conversation, um, just... Any short um, thoughts or um, just pillars, I guess, of what does discipleship look like during these seasons? Um, I think you've given us some really good encouragement about just being patient, um, being present, um, Mm long-suffering and enduring with students. Um, But are are there any other um, kind of words of of help that maybe you've experienced yourself um, in on the receiving side of things and also in the providing through your true snack ministry. And um, what can we learn about discipleship and ministry during these seasons? I mean, I'll, I'll jump on what you asked about, you know, what has been helpful to me. And I kind of said it right off the top is that if you are a little further down in your journey of faith, or if you've experienced doubt, like it is so important for that to be expressed. And that's why I try to express that a lot in my work. So I'm just really honest and blunt about I've had doubts. I still sometimes have doubts. That's so important. And and when people said that to me, it was so encouraging. It, It didn't always feel like it came and like rooted in my heart, but it was so encouraging for someone to say, I've been there. I know what you're saying. You're not crazy. (laughs) <laughs> the answers are hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there is a way forward. So that I would just say, like, as a as a culture within ministries within the church, I think that needs to happen because the stats that come out of Barna just express that most Christians will doubt in their lifetime. And that yeah. like a quarter plus of students who are church going teens don't feel like church is a safe place to express doubts. Those are big problems. And yeah, if we don't want, indeed. you know, doubt to, to root and flower into deconstruction or deconversion later, we have got to do a better job of just making this conversation something that we can have and be mm-hmm. like Jesus, who, who when Thomas, who's, who is seeing him resurrected, goes, I don't know, I need to see, you know, the wounds. 
Mm -hmm. It's shocking to me that Jesus says, okay, if that's what you need, I will be, I will wound myself again for you. So I just, I'm amazed in the gospels. If you ever want to study, just, just look at Jesus' interaction with doubters, his grace and his willingness to, to yeah. serve them and to entertain their questions and to sincerely answer it. It's mind blowing that he would, mm -hmm. after having died for Thomas, be like, if you need to stick your hand in my fresh wound, do you do it? Because that's how much I care about you knowing me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, so how can, how can listeners uh, learn more about Truth Snack, about ministries? I know uh, you have a series that uh, serves youth workers and uh, helps them walk through doubt with, with doubting students. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about that series and about how uh, people can connect with you and, and Truth Snack? Yeah, so... Just generally speaking, you know, Truth Snack is on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. It's like, it, there's just a lot of different resources and different, you know, if you want it to be in text, go to Twitter. If you want to watch mm -hmm. videos, go to YouTube. This kind of stuff all over, yeah. all specifically made to help doubting Christians on their pilgrimage. So that's the heart behind it. The reason at the top that I said faith, doubt, and everything <laughs> is because of the series that I made, which is actually called Faith, Doubt, and Everything in Between. And so that's just what popped into my head at the beginning. Um, but that series, you know, it was so important to me when I was doing this work with Truth Snack that I, I don't want it to just be online resources. I want it to equip ministry leaders and face-to-face -face conversations about this, because I am so, i just so convinced that is so important that this is happening, not just in front of a computer screen, but in small groups with people that love and trust, the, like, that these doubters love and trust, they need to have those conversations. So much of what I've said today is drawn from that series, the, the three episodes and questions that it asks is, is God mad that I'm doubting? Why am I doubting? And how do I overcome doubt? So, so much of what we've discussed has been drawing on that. And so if this content has been helpful, um, imagine having this kind of conversation with your youth group. That's what the series is designed mm -hmm. to do, is to help them get really clear on the journey they need to go on. And uh, unfortunately, just because of the nature of doubt, it probably will start that journey very well for you. And then your task yeah. as a youth ministry is to journey faithfully with those students for the yeah. years to come if they're expressing their doubts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that is the long work of discipleship and evangelism mm -hmm. and, and just faithfully pastoring and shepherding our students. Thanks for joining us on the Truth Snack podcast. If you have something to add, don't be shy to reach out via social media or email me at matt at truthsnack.ca. If this podcast was helpful for you, please share it with someone you think it would benefit. And I'll see you next time.